So welcome, welcome again, everyone. Uh, that's that's our Monday Majlis, and our guest is Alexandra Hoffman. Uh, as as usual, a session will consist of three parts. The first is Alexandra presenting her her, her journey, and then then uh, the second part will be her presenting her her topic on on masculinities in in Nizam uh, is Laila image noon, and then uh, then the third uh, part of the of the majlis will the are. The, the following discussion. So, <clears throat> which won't be recorded. So I met I I uh, I met uh, Alexandra um, roughly a month ago in at a conference, and I heard a previous version of this paper, and I knew that we we want we want to hear this all uh, uh, again, and the, the 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 amended version. So, so I'm, I'm delighted she accepted my invitation, and as I was, um, I also she she also helped me a lot in in setting up this format, which I just uh, mentioned on on um, on having this this introduction introductory part, which is uh, which is on the scholar scholars themselves. It's it's not it's not uh, such an easy thing to to discuss our. Our uh, present, past, and future, and um, but I think so. So the idea was to bring this this after um, after uh, talk dinner discussion before the the talk, so that everyone can can uh, enjoy it. And and it's in general the, the aim is to to liberate our demons and our fears by just by talking them and sharing them. And then we, we, everyone knows who has similar issues or different issues. That that we are we are not alone, um, because we tend to suffer <laughs> just on on our own and think that problems are with us, and it's not the case. So it's it's um, mm, and I hope it's there is this idea that what we have to put on online is is an icon, is the icon of a superhero, which is all all our achievements that what we must produce but uh, superheroes are interesting because there is a real vulnerable human being a real hero behind them and um, and and it's uh, pretty well for all those who who just see the the icon it's always useful to know that that uh, those who achieved this this status or any status they 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 still fight their fights um now so basically this first part of 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 the the se session will be on on how how a girl from switzerland uh got into got to the point when she is going to speak about nizami's uh, uh majnoon <laughs> off to you <laughs> thank you for this introduction, Ishtvan. Um, and thank you again very much um, for invite, inviting me today. Um, I think um, I've told you this before, but it's um, I think it's a really encouraging initiative to kind of um, let people share in, in um, the people that we are and and also highlight the different paths that it can paths that it can take um, uh, to get here. And um, I uh, sorry, thank everyone. Sorry, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, just for yeah. those who newly joined, we discussed that uh, any of the, those who are comfortable to to open your your um, uh, cameras, please please do, Ben, because then the then it's it's more obvious that. Yeah, we are talking to real people. Thank That's you. Right, thank, you. thank you. Yes, if you feel comfortable. I can talk a bit about my my research journey. Um, so I did I did my MA in Switzerland on, on uh, modern Persian literature. Um, I did a, a literary analysis of a novel um, called Dar Hazar by um, an Iranian exile writer. Nashid Amishahi, who writes in her autobiographic 
a diary novel about the days of the 1979 revolution. And I connected the study of that novel with, um, with the thought of, of a collective memory and, and the ways that um, this novel contributes to um, kind of a collective memory of the revolution among uh, the Iranian diaspora. And then, uh, so my, my dissertation project that I used to apply for, for grad school was um, a project on the Sinbad Nana, which is known as the seven viziers in Arabic and, and the seven sages uh, in medieval Europe. It's a, a collection of tales um, that is told by, um, told by various viziers. And the moral of, of uh, the story um, often seems like it is um, all uh, misogynist. And I was really interested in, in that collection of tales and, and still am and um, wanted to do something on, uh, on uh, gender uh, in, in Persian and Arabic versions. And so when I was in, in classwork at U Chicago, um, because you know, in, in the US they make you do another MA so I was taking classes and um, I ended up writing my, my second MA uh, thesis on the Shahname, on, on men and masculinities in the Shahname and kind of that um, interested me. And I was simultaneously reading the Sin, one of the Sinbad Nameds in Persian, which I found very difficult to read at the time. And I, I really didn't know what to do with what to do with the text that didn't find a good angle. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna put this aside. I don't know what to do with it. I'm gonna run with masculinities. And I thought, well, but it would be a pity if I just left my research um, that I did for a couple of years. And I decided to, to write an article or two on the Saint Barname. And in the process of, of writing these articles, um, I found something that I that I really uh, liked. I found an approach that I found uh, really fruitful and interesting, and um, that is kind of connecting um, uh, an ana the analysis of, of the Sinbadname with a history of emotions approach, and specifically um, focusing on akhlaq or um, emotions, morals, um, kind of ethical sense. Um, so what do these tales really tell us about the management of Akhlaq underneath all that um, misogyny? There is something to be said about um, the gender use of Akhlaq, especially um, for, for men. Um, and yeah, so I wrote um, some articles about that and I would like to return to, uh, to the Sinbad Name maybe after I finish my dissertation. So, and my dissertation then um, is about masculinities in um, six uh, Persian masnavis. And it is um, really the first study of um, pre-modern Persian and masculinities. Um, and it spans uh, from the 11th century. Um, the 17th century, uh, have six case studies, um, three epics and three romances. And I would say I have um, like three larger arguments that um, span um, the whole dissertation. Um, one of them is um, language. So the way in which language is used to construct masculinities um, in these texts. Um, so, for example, in, in the epic texts, we have the term mardi, which means manliness, um, and which is often connoted with um, battle prowess or courage or a certain code of honor. And uh, this word doesn't appear as often in, in the romances. Um, however, the language that is associated with it does. So we do find the vocabulary of fighting, of suffering, um, of fearlessness. Um, in, in romances as well. And that's how it, um, like a certain kind of alternative masculinity for lover is constructed. 
Um, and then another strand of argument um, concerns the ways in which um, masculinities and bodies are entangled with each other and how, like in other medieval literatures, they are uh, interdependent um, and how they are both kind of unstable and subject to change. So for example, in, in my second chapter on, on the Kushname, we have this, this monstrous figure, uh, Kush, who has uh, elephant ears and tusks and um, it's like a deviant sexuality and, and, and all that. Uh, he, he had him transform at the end of, of, of the narrative inwardly by, by finding his way to God. Um, and at the same time, outwardly through through plastic surgery, he gets his his ears and his horns removed, and then ends up as a kind of new man uh, that fits into a kind of normative society. Um, and then the last strand concerns the ways in which um, these texts reference each other, um, because I have chosen texts that. Um, are dependent on each other. So, um, for example, in the epic text, I start with the Shahnameh, and then I have two epics that are um, javabs or answers to the first one. And I can um, see how and why mm. they change their models of, of masculinities. Um, the same with uh, the Roman section of Lady Majnun as a kind of central text, um, and then Phases Nalodaman is playing of that um, and the epilogue is kind of a um, an exception to that because it is not referencing Lady Omajnun but another romance of Nizami um, but I did want it to be in my dissertation because it is um, one of the few Masnavis that um, that talks about uh, same-sex uh, love and eroticism. Okay, so um, that's an overview of, of my dissertation and of my um, research journey. And if there are no questions or pressing issues. Um, I would um, continue to the next section of the Monday Majlis. Okay, all yes. right, let's- Yes, please yeah. Alexander, go ahead. Okay, let's get down to business. Um, yes, this is a quote from Mulan. Um, but uh, I would uh, like to, to first thank my sponsors, um, the, the Committee on Southern Asian Studies and the Roshan Institute. Um, they are funding my research currently. And uh, the title of my of my talk today is "What Makes a Man a Man: Nizami's Majnun in a Network of Masculinities." And I don't know there whether there are German speakers here, but maybe you know what I'm alluding to with with the first part of the title. Let's see. I I hope this works now. I'll, I'll play the song for you. This is a song from Herbert Grunemeyer. Did you hear that? Oh, okay. no, sorry, there is no sound. There is we no can't sound. Hear anything? No, sorry. That is too bad. Okay, well then you should Google the song. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a song from the eighties by this iconic German singer, and he sings about um, men and what makes a man a man, and. Um, this is a way to say, you know, the question of what makes a man a man has uh, is a question that people have been asking, not only since the 80s, but um, but since maybe centuries. Um, if you look at uh, Majnun, for example, um, this is uh, a slide that I made for for a class um, where I was teaching uh, Lady Majnun and. I asked my students to to write a, a Tinder profile uh, for Majnun um, as an exercise and then to find an illustration um, to kind of um, get the discussion going on, on like how we today would see and evaluate um, Majnun's masculinity. 
um, and that, that was a very funny exercise. But anyway, let's seriously start now uh, with the question, so how do we understand Majnun? The figure of, of Majnun, especially in the poem of Nizami Ganjavi, has become proverbial for the figure of the suffering lover. Majnun is a character that is both admired for his pro poetic prowess and true love for Lely, and yet he is also pitied for his madness, pain, and eventual death. Generally speaking, scholars have tended to read Majnun either as a profane lover or tragic fool, or have seen him as a mystical prototype experiencing the suffering for union with the divine beloved. Julie Mesami, for example, asserts that Majnun is a bad example of a profane lover. In her book, Medieval Persian Court Poetry, Mesami is concerned with courtly love, as she defines it, I quote, an essential literary phenomenon expressive of a mode of thought that has close ties with courtly values, end quote. She argues that courtly poetry deals not only with the ethics of courtly conduct, but also with the conduct of love, which is associated with virtues like morovat, fotovat, and javon magi. These are all terms that connote con like manliness or chivalry. Mesami concludes that the protagonists of medieval Islamic literature function either as models or exempla of conduct to be emulated or avoided. And she clearly thinks of Majnun as a bad example. She states, and I, I quote again, for Nizami, Majnun has no mystical significance. He is a negative figure, pathetic rather than tragic. Hence, Mesami assumes that courtly poetry promotes proper ways of courtly love. And therefore, I think it is understandable that she considers Majnun as an example of failure. But I wonder whether we can really think of Radio Majnun as a courtly text. As Nezami states in the introductory material to Lelio Majnun, he was at first reluctant to follow Shervan Shah's request to write a poem because he did not regard the story to be suitable material for a Persian at court. In her conversation with his son, Nezami says that it is a sad story set in a barren landscape that is so unlike Persian gardens and banquets. I think what he does with that is preparing the reader's horizon of expectation for a text produced uh, in a courtly milieu, namely that this, it, that this may not be what an audience would expect of a romance. And as Nezami disrupts our expectations of such a text, we also have to reconsider Mesami's measuring stick. If the poem never meant to comment on courtly love, we also cannot fail Majnun for coming up short. On the other side of the spectrum are interpretations that read Majnun largely as a mystical figure. For example, in Ali Asghar Sayyid Borab's monograph, Lelio Majnun. And because uh, Sayyid Ghorab reads Majnun in a mystical sense, I think Majnun is not a negative figure for him. As he says, and I quote, many of Majnun's actions and ideas can be easily justified. He is an archetypical mystic who is trying to re release himself from the world's shackles and to unite himself with the beloved, with a capital B, end quote. And by the way, I'm, I'm really flattered that he is here today and I have great respect both for, for him and for, for Judy Maysami. Um, it is true that the early mystics and Sufis used Majnun to illustrate the path of lovers toward union with the divine before and after Nizami. And it is also true that many mystics and Sufi writers, for example, Ahmad al-Ghazali and especially Attar, consider a lover's path a form of spiritual masculinity, as they assert that manliness is indeed needed to embark on love's journey. But what is up to debate, I think, is whether Nezami really left us enough clues to argue for a full-blown mystical reading. 
in the text itself, relatively little mystical terminology appears. His other works are usually not that mystically, and Nezami is also not really known to have frequented Sufi circles. Nezami may have been pious and favored asceticism, but he was likely not a mystic himself. So what now? What is uh, Majnun if he is not a bad example of a courtly lover, nor an archetypical mystical lover? Okay, I argue that we don't need to um, see Majnun as an archetypal mystic in order to see him as a positive figure. I think there's another way. I argue that Nezami presents Majnun as a part of a polyphonic whole. I think this polyphony is a result of layers in Nizami's likely sources, and I think the network of other male characters acts as a hermeneutic apparatus to Majnun. Let me explain that. I propose we take seriously what Julie Mesami noted about romances, namely that it is a characteristic feature of romances that moral complexities are explored through multiple perspectives on reality. I argue that we should think of Nezami's Lelio Majnun as doing exactly this, putting forth partial impressions that are all true. I refer to this as a polyphony established through various characters in the poem itself. Nezami presents Majnun as part of a polyphonic whole, inherent with tensions that the reader must bear to leave unresolved. This polyphony uh, is a result of various layers in Nizami's likely sources, such as Al-Isfahani's Kitab al -Aghani. I refer here to the work of Rukhaya Khan, who has argued that the reports about Majnun, um, the Arabic uh, reports about Majnun, reveal a distinctly Abbasid perspective on the Umayyad era story, resulting in a heterogeneous assemblage of worldviews and values inherent in the collections. So if already Nizami's sources, likely sources, are informed by various historical discourses about love and lovesickness in various disciplines, such as medical or philosophical texts in Adab or in mystical writing, it should come as no surprise that Nizami's poem itself also reflects some of these discourses. I argue it, it does so in the form of the voices of its characters. Therefore, I think we should look at Majnun through the network and system of masculinities in the poem to both read Majnun against, but also through his fellow characters who all embody different viewpoints and values. In this network and system of masculinities, Majnun's character is valued and evaluated differently each time. The polyphony of voices, identities, and value systems of other men constantly rub against Majnun's own, situating him in a seemingly uneasy place within a framework of masculinities that are more normative. And yet, a close reading of the poem shows that these tensions often resolve in Majnun's favor and that the more normative masculinities are faulty in one aspect or another. The network of other men acts as a hermeneutic apparatus, a polyphonic mirror in which the figure of Majnun becomes more legible. In what follows, I, I would like to offer um, some examples of varying voices. Let's start with, with Madnoon's father, who is an elder and, and well-respected man of the Banu Amir, um, who appears in the text as a figure that is concerned mostly about fathering a successor. Given his position at the top of the hierarchy of his tribe, he has a preconceived idea of the kind of social power and prestige his son should have as well. Throughout the poem, his concern over Majnun is motivated by his desire to cure his illness, mostly it seems, in order to have a respectable heir. His efforts to cure him, like suggesting marriage to other women, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and his well-meant advice, they're all futile. 
His frustration grows because he thinks that Majnun could just end his lovesickness and madness through a conscious decision and return to sanity. He says, for example, don't abandon your judgment. For a man without judgment has no solid base like a legless worm. With such a statement, his father sets a normative expectation for Majnun that he can't fulfill. And he undermines his son by implicit, implicitly comparing him to a worm. The father's perspective, I think, is steeped in traditional hierarchical thinking, and there is no understanding for the fancies of a lover. Madnoon's uncle, on the other hand, is a figure who is more sympathetic to ascetic ideals. Here, in this illustration, we see Majnun visited by his uncle Selim. Majnun is depicted as emaciated and with noticeably darker skin tone. Majnun, one with the barren environment he lives in, therefore stands in stark contrast with his well-clothed and well-nourished visitor. Instead of accepting the clothing and the food offerings Salim's bring, however, Majnun wants to eat what grows around him in the wilderness. Salim reacts in a rather sympathetic way. When Salim saw that still skillful Majnun was content with herbage for food, out of esteem for such poor nourishment, he answered him with gentle friendliness. From eating the grains of thyme, many birds have fallen into the trap. Whoever has more desire for grains will have more pain and danger in the world. Whoever is like you, satisfied with herbage, is a king in his own world. So we notice here that um, Salim replies out of ragbat or esteem. And his reference to an ascetic, Majnun, as a part shah, sets up the tale that follows in the narrative. It's a tale of a hermit who wins the admiration of a king because of his contentment with eating foraged plants. So while I think that Salim is not uncritical of Majnun's excessive lovesickness, he does seem to be sympathetic to values of an ascetically minded community. Unlike Majnun's parents, Salim is a character that recognizes the worth of Majnun's austerities as a performance of renunciation. The narrator may be on Salim's side, as another example of a male character shows. It is Majnun's rival, Ibn Salam. Ibn Salam is introduced as a wealthy and respected man one with many kinsmen and high standing, and therefore an appropriate suitor for Lely. He sends loads of goods and an eloquent messenger to sway Lely's father. And indeed, his father cannot withstand the messenger and agrees to give Lely into, I quote, the maw of the dragon, end quote. As it turns out, however, Ibn Salam is not much of a dragon at all. His power seems to build to be built on external props like money or messengers, but not much else. When he tries to approach Lely after their wedding, she smacks him so hard that he falls unconscious like a dead man and does not dare to touch her ever again. The narrator foreshadows Ibn Salam's illness and death with ruminations on diet and food. Ibn Salam falls ill because his temperament is out of balance. Against the doctor's advice, however, I quote, he does not restrain himself from what is bad, end quote. After only a few days, Ibn Salam dies, and the narrator, narrator's admonishing asides show us that Ibn Salam is at fault for not showing dietary restraint. Such lack of self-control when it comes to diet stands in stark contrast to Majnun's asceticism. Hence, while Ibn Salam appears to be a wealthy, well-respected man in the beginning, it turns out that his reliance on externalities, money, messengers, masks a lack of power and self-control that becomes obvious as the story progresses. My last example concerns a fellow lover named Salam Baghdadi. As his uh, Mr. Baghdadi alludes, alludes to, he is a city dweller, 
and beyond informed that Majnun's poems way, made their way from the Najd to Baghdad, and Salam hears his poems at, in gatherings of Zarifan. He does may be a Zarif himself, or at least someone who attends their gatherings. The Zurafa were a group of refined literati based in 10th century Baghdad. As, as described in the work of Al-Washa or Ibn Dawood, they romanticized the true Udri love of the Bedouins, which they judged to be a refined emotion. Like a true Zarif, Salam is an elegant young man with a fashionable taste in clothing, food, and love poetry. When Salam presents himself to Majnun in his fine clothes and a bag full of exquisite food, Majnun does not want him to stay. And laughingly, Majnun says, Oh, good man, nourished by delicacy, the path is full of danger, turn around. Even though you're a man, you're not my man, for out of a hundred sorrows of mine, you haven't endured a single one. Majnun thus perceives his way of living as one that is dangerous. And he connects walking this dangerous path with masculinity. Majnun clearly does not see Salam as his equal, and he has not reached the depth in love and suffering that Majnun has. Soon, Salam's zarif-minded view of love and life crashes with Majnun's. Once he realizes that Majnun not only refuses to eat, but also doesn't sleep, he tries to argue with Majnun about his life choices. He says, your fasting is admirable, but you should absolutely eat a bite or two, end quote. Majnun gives him a long chastising reply. And at the end, the narrator concludes, when the friend, Mendes Salam, recognized his skill, he did not lose another word in error. Don't be disrespectful with anybody so that you don't need to apologize for a mistake afterwards. Here the narrator seems to imply that Salam Baghdadi was wrong and that and the rest of his meeting with Majnun does not go over well for, he, for him either. They roam around the desert for a few days, but, but Majnun does not sleep nor eat. And therefore, the narrator continues, neither does poor Salam, bichare Salam. When he sees that his tablecloth is empty of provisions, Salam decides to leave. Out of weakness, he says his goodbyes and returns to Baghdad. Hence, for Salam, weakness and deprivation is a reason to return to his comfortable city life. While for Majnun, a weak state without food or sleep is normal, Salam physically cannot keep up with Majnun's austerities. As these examples show, Nezami demonstrates that, or shows Majnun through the voices of other characters, his father, for example, or his uncle Salim. Often the narrator supports Majnun against men who embody more normative masculinities, like Ibn Salam, Beli's husband, or Salam Baghdadi, the Zarif. You can also note here that the three characters, Salim, Ibn Salam, Salam Baghdadi, they all have names um, that contain elements uh, on, based on the Arabic root SLM. Salim means healthy and Salam mean, means both peace and well-being. The three characters that share names that are associated with health. It's unlikely to be a coincidence that encounters with all of these three characters comment in one way or another on Majnun's asceticism and especially on his fasting. As we've already seen, Salam Baghdadi is too pampered for Majnun's way of life and cannot handle an empty sofre. Ibn Salam disregards his doctor's advice on nutrition and is fatally immoderate with his food consumption. Majnun's uncle Salim, on the other hand, is the only man who appears to truly understand Majnun's frugality. Hence, a concern with fasting and bodily soundness is present in all three cases. Nizami weaves these themes through the poem, such as asceticism and fasting in particular, 
functions as one of the touchstone elements through which the narrator holds up a mirror to other male characters in the poem and shows them, as well as the reader, that their conceptions of normative behavior, nourishment, and bodily strength do not hold up against Majnun's. I would like to now do transition to a closer look at Majnun and some of the ways in which his masculinity is constructed. However, first, I want to show you in order to, to stay a little bit balanced that Majnun is also an outcast and at times barely human. I'll keep this section short though, so that we can um, move on to the ways in which um, he does um, have a gain status um, before our time runs out. Okay, so we've seen in the illustration that uh, Majnun is very thin. Um, his body is indeed described as, and I quote, bones covered in skin, or he has become thin as a hair. Majnun is also likened to animals and deeves. For example, a stranger describes Majnun like this when asked about him. He's in such and st such narrow wasteland, twisting like a snake on a stone, mad, miserable, and sick like a deev, hidden from human sight. From being wounded, his soul has been pierced, the marrow of his bone is showing. So this passage describes Majnun's madness, pain, and sickness, as well as the destitute state of his body and mind. As a snake, deev, wounded madman, madman, he is the embodiment of love, sickness, and suffering. However, while living outside of civilization and all human norms, despite, or maybe, because of his liminality, Majnun is also invested with an alternative language of power. In the wilderness, animals seek his company. Lions, foxes, wolves, deer, and rabbits all, need, all live near him and protect him in exchange for food and care. In the text, Majnun's alternative kingdom, a kingdom of animals, is imbued with the vocabulary of military power. The wild animals of the plain rush to his service and form an army camp, Lashkar Gah. They obey his commands and he rules over all of them, like King Suleiman. As the animals are presented as anthropomorph anthropomorphized servant attending to a human sovereign, it is reasonable to assume that human onlookers are meant to see his alternative kingdom as a recognizable, if orth unorthodox, form of power. At this alternative court, there is a lion, like a guardian with a sword drawn, a wolf keeping watch, ready to give up his life as the commander of the night guard, and all the animals draw ranks around Majnun, who sits in the middle, king-like. These non-human servants threaten any potential intruders and ensure that visitors approach only with Majnun's permission, as, and I quote, they instantly tear apart those who do not seem to please him. For example, here, this is an illustration of a scene that occurs towards the end of the poem where Lady and Majnu meet and upon seeing each other, they faint um, and they are sheltered and protected from intruders by Majnu's animals, but also one or two people may be dead in the background. So by depicting Majnun as, a, as possessing a veritable military court with deadly bodyguards, Nizami constructs a masculinity for Majnun that is also based on power, even if it is over an alternative society. Another way in which the vocabulary of fighting is used um, is with love itself. Majnun makes it clear that he does not see being in love as a choice. When blamed, as he so often is, for being insane, he says, it's not my fault. With a love that is such an affliction and desolation, he says, you know that it can't be voluntary. After his father implores him to return home, 
Majnun tries to follow his advice and sober up, but love, it seems, has other plans for him. When repentance from love wagged its tongue, love came and twisted repentance's ears. In love, where a bishop is upon, someone who has fallen is manly. Okay, so what does that mean? It is clear which of the two forces at play here is more powerful. It is love that trumps repentance from love. That means love prohibits Majnun from repenting from it and the lover has no choice to obey. However, the narrator asserts that being forced by love does not make Majnun unmanly. He invokes a game of chess where a bishop is reduced to a pawn, the weakest chess piece. The manly thing to do here is to submit to the power of love and weather the suffering brings. Majnun also maintains that fear in love is misplaced. He uses the language of fighting, swords, and fearlessness when he describes his attitude towards love. He says, for example, that lovers should not be terrified of sacrificing themselves. If they're afraid, they would be better off having their heads cut off right away. Hence, Majnun employs vocabulary commonly associated with honorable conduct in battle and therefore with rather hegemonic notions of masculinity to describe his own situation as a lover. To sum up, Majnun's masculinity is constructed through his poetic and rhetorical prowess. That's a fact that I didn't talk much about today. His kingship over animals, as well as his commitment to submitting to love and preparedness to die. During his lifetime, Majnun's alternative masculinity is acknowledged only by a few, his uncles and other lovers, for example, and he thus stays marginal in society at large. After his death, however, when his and Lely's tomb become a pilgrimage site, his marginal exemplarity becomes integrated into a more mainstream appreciation of his love and life. So now if you go back to the question I asked in the beginning, namely, how we should, should we understand Majnun? I have a suggestion for you. As you can see from, from this meme that I made, um, take it with a grain of salt, of course. But I want what I want to say with this is, the poem's polyphony creates a multifaceted Majnun. And this is why I believe that we cannot condemn Majnun as a negative example, nor as a completely mystical lover. For, for Nizami, Majnun's love is complicated and multifaceted, but it is also pure. As Nizami says, and I quote, even a cold hearted reader will become a lover if they're not dead. End quote. It appears that Nizami believes in the transformative power of his poem and of Majnun's loves with love within it, not as a negative example to be avoided, but rather as a lover in an extreme state of devotion, a multifaceted character with all of the polyphonic voices that collectively define him. In sum, what is remarkable about Nizami's Lelio Majnun is that its author constructs a composite, at times contradictory, masculinity through the voices of vari various characters. Mothers and fathers, dandies and poets, beloveds and lovers, all have a say in constructing Majnun's masculinity. Thank you very much for listening.